thanks for checking out my video. Today, I'm excited to share with you uh, the first study of the great series where we're going to cover a special artist by the name of Edward Bannister. I, at least to my knowledge, consciously had never viewed any of Bannister's paintings and uh, don't recall learning much, if anything, about him in any art history classes that I may have taken in the past. Um, he was brought to my attention by one of my YouTube subscribers, and I'm real appreciative of it because when we take a look at his work, I think you'll agree it's it's really incredibly well done. It is part of, or he was part of the tonalism movement, and he was born in Canada and spent most of his life living in New England. So here we go, Ed Bannister. And here we are in front of a blank canvas. I will tell you what I've learned by doing these painting studies in my Study of the Great series. It's a little easier to get started because we have a clear end in mind. And in this case, in my mind, it's not necessarily a perfect uh, rendition or reproduction of the original art. It's more of an exploration of some ways with which we think maybe they got to the end result that they got to. So what I'm doing now along those lines is just blocking in some of the major darker shapes that are in shadows, AKA the shadow patterns within the painting, looking to define the three to five, and in some cases maybe as many as seven or so major shapes within the painting. And throughout the video, I will show a snapshot or a screenshot of the original painting done by Ed Bannister. So I'm just scrubbing in a mixture, a pre-mixed puddle of sap green and a painter's gray with a little bit of ivory black. And I'll go back and forth. I'll use different strokes uh, based upon the shape and, and, and uh, the type of texture that I'm looking to get in a particular area. And this is pretty much how I'll go about completing the initial phase of this painting study. Just a little background on my Study of the Great series. I've done uh, nearly 20 or so videos like this one. And the intention is to help up-level my painting ability. And I focused particularly on the tonalism movement because those paintings from the late 1800s and early 1900s have always kind of caught my eye. Uh, there is something, um, I think, related to the mood, uh, the blend and synthesis of um, you know, the Hudson River School and other schools of painting that uh, just draw me to them. So that's where I have spent my time focusing. And you can see in the upper right hand corner, another image of the painting and just working my way, building up the major shapes slowly but surely and trying to do so with this one single uh, flat brush with the intention of creating some textures as I go. And while I create these painting studies, I find that I can't help but internalize some of the decision-making that may have been taken on by the original artist as it relates to you know, what I might leave in or take out of a particular painting, how I'll go about rendering different shapes and filtering out certain details. Also, uh, it forces me to uh, slow down and take some time when it comes to decisions related to color mixing. And I am largely self-taught as a painter, so you know this sort of process is invaluable to me. Also, you know, as I alluded to earlier, um, you know, it, it's a little less intimidating in a lot of ways because I know I'm going to fall short of what the original artist. Uh, these masters, these past masters have created. So there's really no pressure. It's really just uh, really play, learning through play. And, uh, you know, it's it's helped me progress, I think, 
uh, fairly significantly over a short period of time. I'm going to go into a little bit of uh, the biographical history on Edward Mitchell Bannister. He really is an interesting figure in the art world. He was born in St. Andrews, New Brunswick, Canada, and he passed away in Providence, Rhode Island in 1901. He was active in the New England art community, uh, particularly in Boston, Massachusetts. And, um, you know, Bannister, it's said, based upon his bio posted on the Smithsonian uh, Art Museum, Smithsonian American Art Museum, that is, he created a sensation when one of his paintings won first prize at the Philadelphia Centennial Exposition in 1876. He was also uh, respected and knowledgeable art critic at that time. Paintings by African Americans from the collection of the National Museum of African Art, a book of postcards, uh, was where he was prominently featured. And Edward Bannister's determination to become a successful art artist largely was fueled, it was said, by uh, critics that he had encountered, um, and also naysayers that had some derogatory thoughts that they had shared about the African-American art community. He was born in November of 1828. His father was a native of Barbados. Bannister's mother, Hannah Alexander Bannister, who lived in New Brunswick, and who Bannister credited with fostering his earliest artistic interests. There's not much known about her. Bannister's father apparently died early in life, and after the death of his mother in 1844, he lived in New Brunswick, and after several years, he took a job at sea and was, uh, apparently, this was a customary uh, career path for many of the young men living in St. Andrews at the time. In 1848, Bannister moved to Boston, where he held a variety of jobs before he became a barber and eventually learned to paint. Bannister painted in the Boston Studio Building and also enrolled in several evening classes at Lowell Institute, where the noted sculptor anatomist Dr. William Rimmer, uh, I guess, taught and uh, maybe took a, a little bit of a mentorship role with Bannister. Only a few of Bannister's paintings from the 1850s and 1860s uh, survive to this day, and it prevents really a stylistic assessment of his early period of painting. While Bannister lived in Boston, he must have seen and been influenced by the Barbizon school-inspired paintings of William Morris Hunt, who studied in Europe and held numerous public expositions or <laughs> exhibitions rather in Boston during the 1860s. American landscape painters were increasingly aware of the simple rustic motifs and pictorial poetry of the French Barbizon paintings by Jean Baptiste Corot and Jean Francois Millet and others in the mid 19th century. And this eventually uh, was synthesized, many think, with the Hudson River School style painting and other similar schools and grew into the, um, yeah, the tonalism movement. So uh, over time, it's been uh, written that uh, and suggested that many of Bannister's landscape paintings uh, were small and, and they've also uh, darkened in tone considerably with his age. Um, his paintings... Uh, were free and devoid of any sort of social statement, it seems, or, um, you know, racial overtones. And many of the small figures seen frequently in his landscapes, you know, appear to be, you know, working folks, um, you know, in the landscape. Although the majority of Bannister's paintings are landscapes, he also did some figure studies and religious scenes, seascapes, still lifes, and so on. Bannister was attracted primarily to picturesque motifs, including cottages, castles, cattle, dawn, sunsets, small bodies of water, and portrayed nature as a calm and submissive force in his work, much like many of the other tonalists. At this point in the painting, I'm starting to make quite a bit of progress with the block-in of the major shapes on land, and... Um, 
you know, I might add, I am going to attempt to finish this painting in one sitting, at least for the purposes of the video here. And I might come back after the painting dries and make some touch-ups, trying to, uh, you know, perfect or improve upon some of the basic shapes. And then again, another pass, um, you know, I'll attempt to make some enhancements to some of the color, uh, trying to enrich it with glazes and uh, some other techniques that might help improve the quality of the color and some of the illusions uh, associated with atmospheric depth and so forth. But for the purposes of this painting, it'll be by and large an a la prima painting, which is uh, quite different than the approach that most of the tonalists take. I uh, don't know much about uh, Bannister's process. There's not a lot of documentation on it that I can find, at least in my early stages of my research. So he may very well have painted this a la prima himself, but I would assume he may have uh, taken the very same type of approach that some of the other more prominent tonalists and painters of his time did, uh, often improving upon paintings over long periods of time, trying to perfect the different effects that uh, the artist is trying to render. So now I'm starting to block in some of the darker reflections in the water. The painting's really starting to take shape. You can get a sense for, you know, directionally where it's going to go. Um, also, you know, as I bring the original up on screen in a thumbnail image, you'll see some of the major differences. Um, you know, for example, I made the decision to make the uh, distant hillside or mountain uh, on the left-hand side a little bit more prominent in my version of the painting uh, for no particular reason other than, you know, I like the idea of having a little bit more blue and uh, purple in the painting and, you know, just love, you know, the big uh, hills that you'll find uh, in the northeast here off in the distance. Now, it is uh, possible that this painting may have been based upon a scene that Bannister witnessed in New Hampshire. It's uh, my understanding that he did take some trips to the White Mountains and, um, you know, enjoyed painting there from time to time. But I'm not really sure the location or the name of this painting. I'm going to go ahead and use some of my pre-mixed ultramarine blue and white mixture. And I'm going to start blocking in some of the major shapes amongst the, the cloud masses in the sky. I'm going to start um, by building in some of these uh, darker blue areas and I'll key to the lighter colors in the sky. In this particular painting, um, the, the sky scene or scenery um, that Bannister rendered, uh, it seemed to be based upon you know, kind of a mostly cloudy day where uh, there was quite a mixture of some grays and some golden tones as well throughout with, um, you know, some, some hazy blue sky kind of poking through and we're going to try and recreate that. We'll also put some of the sky color in the water just to make sure there's some variance in the lighter tones and the mid tones that are in the water. I'm just cleaning my brush. And now we're going to go add, um, you know, one of the other tones in the sky, and that's that golden hue, um, you know, some of the light reflecting off of, some of the sunlight reflecting off of some of the clouds and perhaps maybe the dust particles in the clouds. And um, these clouds, like is the case most of the time, um, don't have much of a well-defined shape. And I'm just trying to follow a similar pattern, not exact, but a similar pattern to what Bannister had created in his original painting. And it's mostly a mixture of yellow ochre and white with a little bit of painter's gray, just looking to bring down um, the saturation as much as possible. And I'll work some of that into the water as well. 
and we'll just keep working our way through. I'm actually really excited about the idea of incorporating more of Bannister's works into my Study of the Great series. You know, in this long-term series, I've covered uh, quite a few uh, different artists, uh, but just looking through some of the images online uh, of some of his paintings, it really kind of hit home for me. Um, some of the scene choices uh, remind me of, you know, some of the scenes in my local community uh, within the Pocono Mountains, and then also within some of the scenes, you know, that I've witnessed in areas like Maine and New Hampshire and Vermont and upstate New York. Some of the pastoral scenes with uh, the cows, for example, uh, there's an untitled painting known as Four Cows Waiting in a Pond, uh, you know, that I've looked at, and another untitled painting, um, which uh, seems to have been named Woman with Cattle and Sheep at Dusk. Um, and, and then another one that I'm looking at here called uh, Bright Scene of Cattle Near Stream. You know, they really appeal to me. I, you know, they're, they're uh, beautiful paintings that I'm hoping I can incorporate into uh, this this study the great series that I've embarked on, and a little bit more about that. It's a long term series, uh, and again, I'm I'm using it to learn more about art history, also to level up my painting ability, and you know, hopefully help others do so as well. And uh, you know, I'm, I'm I'm on the fence with this, but as I start to accumulate these painting studies and and they're fully cured. I know it's um, not customary for artists to sell painting studies like this. Um, it can be somewhat controversial. Uh, reproductions of original works and so on are not things where um, it's not it's not appropriate to capitalize on it financially and market them in any way as being our own works of art. They're, they're really supposed to be intended for uh, you know for the artist's use. Um, and enjoyment. Uh, one thing I'm, I'm thinking about is perhaps maybe putting a few of them up for sale and donating 100% of the proceeds to charity. Um, you know, over this past year, I, I have raised some money for a couple different charities, but um, you know, it was usually based upon the sale of original art. But I think that might be a direction I'll go in. We'll see. I'll give it some more thought. In the meantime, I am... Uh, trying to blend some of the edges of the tree line uh, with the sky. Uh, this is something you'll see in tonalism and impressionism and you know a couple of different styles of painting. Um, and oftentimes I regret that I don't I don't spend enough time in this particular stage of the painting going back and forth uh, between the edges of the trees and the foliage and the sky. It really can help create a nice effect where, um, and you often see this in nature, the edges of the tree line where the foliage kind of thins out, you have this interesting dance, especially when trees are depicted off in the distance or viewed off in the distance between the sky and the tree. It's very difficult to see where one ends and one begins. Um, so it, it can be useful to spend quite a bit of time there in a painting to create that effect. And in the original, there's um, this interesting uh, grayish beige cloud kind of coming up over that blue mountain. I just incorporated that and working in some of that, that beige color throughout the sky as well. In this case, uh, putting in some sky holes, realizing that the, the color was a little too light, a little too bright, so... I brought in some darker gray, still too light. So I'll go through and I'll fix that. Yeah, but working that lighter color throughout the sky. At this point, you could really see the painting starting to take shape. And you know, I'll just be working to refine some you know, some shapes and, and some of the effects as it relates to the water, the sky, and you know, creating the illusion of depth on, you know, the banks of this body of water and uh, within and amongst the forest. 
that's just beyond the banks. And here's a little excerpt that I, I think is interesting. And this this kind of hints toward uh, difficulty that one might find actually categorizing Bannister and his work. Uh, following the Centennial Exposition, Bannister's reputation grew and numerous commissions enabled him to devote all of his time to painting. He executed a large number of landscapes, most of which depict quiet bucolic scenes rendered in somber tones with thick impasto. While Bannister's initial influence probably stemmed from the Barbizon-inspired works of William Morris Hunt, his paintings are reflective of an artist who loved the quiet beauties of nature and represented them in a realistic manner. Bannister's mid middle period landscapes from the 1870s were generally executed in broad masses of heavy impasto with few details. They also evoke a tranquil mood that became one of the hallmarks of Bannister's, life, Bannister's style. Later landscapes of the 1880s and 1890s employed a more gentle impasto and loosely applied broken color, similar to the Impressionist techniques. So then again, um, you know, just based upon that brief uh, description, you could really see he... He uh, may not actually fall into any one category, and I, I maybe have miscategorized him as being part of the tonalist movement, but you know, who knows? It's really up to, I think, the individual. Um, there are artists that uh, transcend categories, you know, he's one of them, and, uh, you know, but I put him in the same category as some of the other great American artists. I, I think I would, just based upon, um, you know, his work and um, you know, how devoted he was to, to his craft. And so I would, I would think that, uh, he easily can be put in the same category as the other, you know, great American painters that, uh, some of which are, are part of the series. Now, while working through this, I am getting the sense that, uh, you know, I've oversimplified in a couple of key areas, particularly in the shadows of the tree canopy and the banks of this river. Um, but you know what? I'm okay with that. I, I can you know, work through this stage of the painting and I think um, you know, continue to build it up as much as I can in this one sitting and then come back to it after... You know, I've had time to detach from it and you know, observe it a few times, you know, walking into the room after not seeing it for a while. And then I can, um, you know, perhaps make some enhancements, like I mentioned earlier, by way of glazing and other techniques, you know, to help build up and strengthen some of the weaker areas that I think I'll have a hard time correcting. Uh, and one example of that is, um, you know, in the original, there's a, a strong sense of um, of texture uh, in a lot of the darker shadow areas, both uh, on the banks, under the tree canopies, and also in and amongst the clouds. And I just thinking through what my next steps are here at this point in the painting, I, I get the sense I'm going to fall a little short um, yeah, I don't want to overwork it and create, you know, muddy, muddy colors. So I think my gut says my best bet will be to let it dry and and then use some of those um, some of those techniques that I mentioned earlier. But for now, I'll, I'll, I'll build it out as much as I can. I'm working through, you know, trying to create a sense of, uh, you know, some of the mud on the banks and uh, continue to, you know, build up. Uh, some of the shadow patterns in the areas where they need to be built up with mixtures of uh, blue and black and gray. Uh, continue to build out some of the colors amongst the reflections in the water, like I'm doing right now. And I'll come up on shore and do the same thing under you know, the shade of those trees. I know in um, Western Maine and and uh, New Hampshire and Vermont, you do have some beautiful, beautiful rivers, uh, you know, cutting through the landscape. 
in, in those states. And what I was most impressed by, I remember a few years back, my family and I visited, um, I think it was North Conway in New Hampshire. I would, I would just love to go back there and spend some time painting. Um, and, and would also like to do so uh, in New York State as well, the Catskills and Adirondacks. You know, as a kid, spent a lot of time there. So, you know, this scene is somewhat reminiscent. Uh, there's a lot of similarities, you know, different mountain ranges and towns and so forth. But, you know, a lot of similarities amongst the uh, the landscapes and in those areas here in the northeastern United States. Today I am painting on a 11 by 7 stretch canvas. Nothing too fancy or expensive, probably just something I picked up at Michael's. Uh, taking a little bit of a hiatus from painting on my, my handmade wood panels. Um, also, you know, coming up, what I have in the back of my mind, I, I signed up for my first plein air event coming up here in September. And also for my first showing of some of my original paintings. So, you know, excited about that. But, uh, you know, what I'm trying to do is, you know, leave some of those homemade wood panels in reserves um, in preparation for that plein air event coming up in September. I'm just working my way around, just refining some of the shapes in the trees, handling that little dance between some of the highlights and the mid-tones, and, um, you know, trying to make sure that I build the right amount of definition in the right places uh, within the tree, using different strokes. You know, these obviously are evergreen trees, and, you know, I feel like that diagonal stroke that I just took, um, my intention was to kind of enhance the height of those more mature evergreen trees. And I'm going to do the same throughout the um, the other areas, kind of uh, lower lying areas of tree masses there. I'm going to work my way through and add some of that green uh, to the reflections in the water. Naturally, the different ripples in the water would pick some of that up especially from this vantage point. I continue to work my way through with these uh, downward strokes, mostly in the water. And just a couple notes about my palette, I guess better late than ever. And it's really not a big deal because it's pretty much the same palette I use for these types of paintings all the time. I have yellow ochre, sap green, burnt umber, French ultramarine blue, a little cerulean blue, cadmium red, a little bit of cadmium lemon yellow. I incorporated um, just recently some painter's gray into my palette and ivory black. The painter's gray I never had used before, but it, I, I have found it helpful uh, to quickly mix uh, some of the grays usually tilted toward blue or um, purple or green. Um, in an attempt to quickly desaturate some of the colors and bring some different tonality to the painting. So uh, that's my palette, and uh, I forgot to mention that earlier. Sorry about that, but I'll include that list in my notes for anybody who might be interested in figuring out how to build up their palette for the first time. I am likely to go shopping for... Uh, some different pigments and colors. For now, you know, I'm using kind of like the mid-tier Windsor & Newton uh, oil paints. And just with where I am in my painting, you know, I haven't really gone for some of the pricey uh, paint manufacturers that you see a lot of the more experienced uh, painters kind of recommend. But uh, I think I might, might start experimenting with some of those here shortly in the near future. Now, quick and probably the final note about uh, Bannister's biography. Um, it's noted here, I see, um, in the Smithsonian biography, in spite of his limited training and experience, Bannister was among Providence's, that's Providence, Rhode Island, leading painters during the 1870s and 1880s. He was well-liked and respected by his fellow citizens on January 9th, 
1901, Bannister died while attending a prayer meeting at his church. Shortly after his death, the Providence Art Club mounted a memorial exhibition of 101 of Bannister's paintings owned by Providence collectors. Bannister's grave in North Burial Ground, Providence, is marked by a rough granite boulder 10 feet high bearing a carving of a pallet with the artist's name and a pipe. A bronze plaque also adorns the monument and is inscribed with a poem which reads, in part, this pure and lofty soul who, while he portrayed nature, walked with God. Edward M. Bannister was the only major African-American artist of the late 19th century who developed his talents without the benefit of European exposure. So there you have it. Um, it definitely someone who defied the odds, particularly with the American culture at that time. Very, very, very impressive and uh, very grateful. Um, I stumbled upon him based upon the recommendation of uh, one of my friends and uh, subscribers to my YouTube channel. After reading his biography, I can't help but you know feel a little bit of reverence and you know feel humbled and you know just very grateful that you know this this man was able to accomplish what he was, um, in spite of some of the likely headwinds that uh, he found at that time. So. So there you have it. I am uh, going to continue on with this painting and work my way through. Uh, just thinking about uh, what I've shared so far about the biographical information of Bannister here, you know, I'm realizing that it, it might be beneficial to share some information uh, that that kind of helps illuminate, you know, what what some of these terms are. The Barbizon School, for example, versus tonalism. Uh, the Barbizon School. Uh, was essentially a group of painters that were part of a movement, and it really was a movement toward realism, which kind of grew out of uh, the dominant art theme at the time as in Europe, known as the Romantic Movement. The Barbizon School was uh, said to be active roughly from 1830 through 1870, and it uh, looks like it was born uh, within or named after the village of Barbizon, which is located in France, not too far from a big, um, I guess, area called the Forest of Fontainebleau. I guess it's a spot where many artists gathered at the time and uh, built their landscape paintings. This movement, the Barbizon School, included folks like Rousseau, um, Dupree, uh, Narcissi, uh, Virgilio Diaz, and Jean-Francois Millet, as I mentioned earlier. Corot was also you know, part of this. And a lot of folks believe that the influence of these great painters from Europe had a, a huge influence on uh, American painters. And as a result of that, um, sprung the tonalism movement, uh, mostly in the United States. And uh, there are quite a few famous painters, including um, Charles Warren Eaton and others who I've covered in some of my Study the Great series. And there are many other famous painters that are categorized as tonalists. Uh, George Inez, who is uh, considered by most to be the father of the American landscape painting movement. Also Whistler as well. And, you know, all these folks who came up, you know, roughly at the same time, you know, James Whistler, for example, um, you know, they achieved success both commercially for the most part um, and also uh, creatively as painters uh, by following this tonalism movement, which very, very much by and large, um, you know, is, is just a way of painting, but also a way of life for, for many of these folks. And as far as, uh, you know, having similar views on um, humanity and mysticism and spirituality, uh, which they, you know, tried to incorporate into the artwork as well. And that's where, you know, I think, um, you know, Bannister is an interesting character on the scene here because um, it looks like based upon the academic 
descriptions of his his work. Uh, he is uh, heavily influenced by the Barbizon school and their style of painting. Uh, there are also some characteristics based upon his lifestyle and style of painting and how it evolved over time that you know kind of lead me to conclude that he definitely may have been in, influenced by the tonalism movement. And I'm just going to kind of bucket him into that category for convenience sake and uh, you know move on with some of the description of how I'm going to go about tackling this painting study from here on out. Yeah, I went with my gut here uh, with this mixture of ultramarine blue and a little bit of uh, titanium white, and I'm incorporating that into the sky. I will look to mute it um, a little bit. Um, I incorporated that toward the top of the scene for several reasons. One, I wanted to make the sky a little bit more interesting, and I also felt like uh, there'll be more that I can do if I do come back uh, later on after the painting dries um, with um, some of the work I might do to uh, to improve the painting and, and lift the painting up if I if I have that that color pigment in the sky. So I just went with my gut. We'll see how it works out. I'm also working my way through uh, the, the water, trying to uh, now lighten up uh, the water that's reflecting the sky. You know, it's customary in uh, most paintings with water. You know, the, the sky is the source of the light, of all the light in these landscape paintings. So you know, we, we uh, in most cases, will have the sky take on the brightest and lightest quality in the painting and uh, possess the, the most intensity when it comes to the brightness that is part of the scene. And the reflection in the water uh, is a reflection of that. So it tends to have a lot of the same qualities. Uh, we'll just try to mute it a little bit in some instances or diffuse it and make sure that it doesn't have the same level of saturation. But many, if not all, the same colors will be represented in the reflection that you'll see throughout the scene where it makes sense. Now I'm gonna go through and uh, create some ripples on the water to further enhance uh, you know, the suggestion that we're looking at a body of water there and uh, in this particular case, those ripples are picking up some of that blue in the sky. I'm taking a step back and looking at this painting and realizing that I have an opportunity to create some more interesting textures in the sky by using a crumpled up shop towel. And uh, come back through and make sure that I do that throughout that part of the sky toward the, you know, the upper part of the scene. I think what I'll do, what I'll probably do is come back with some glazing, uh, with some mixture of, um, you know, a nice gray, just so I can, uh, you know, pick up some of the darker parts of the clouds in the sky to help the scene a little bit. And uh, just working my way through, kind of going back and forth between uh, the different shades of gray in the sky and, and the little golden hue as well. Again, more than anything else, not looking to perfect any shapes here, just looking to create some interest and where the opportunity lies. Um, you build out shapes that try to draw the viewer's eye toward the center of the painting. Just a general observation, you know, that I have time to, uh, I've had time now to kind of process the, the progress that I've made here. Yeah, I definitely am seeing that there is, in my study, less contrast between uh, the shadow areas and some of the brighter spots in the painting. And, you know, I'm constantly going back and forth in my mind, you know, whether or not um, that's something I want to try to address now in the initial lay-in in this a la prima painting that I'm producing, or if it's something that I'll want to correct uh, with the use of glazing and scrumbling and so on and so forth after the after the initial painting dries. I also might very well just leave it the same and and um, you know consider it done um, 
in a slightly different style and a uh, you know, d- just leave it as a, a little bit of a, a brighter painting. And, you know, no matter what that decision is, it's okay. Um, you know, as long as I'm learning, that's kind of my mindset here. And um, you know, so we'll see where it goes. But for now, just looking to further enhance some of the movement in the water, taking some strokes of some of that sea, same pigment that I have in a brush uh, that I use in the sky and just wiping it across. Yeah, it's my belief that this is um, kind of a, a wider part of a, of a river. So uh, you're just cr- trying to create the illusion in this painting that the water is moving you know, downstream and creating these sorts of ripples. Now I'm looking to create similar movement in and amongst the trees, these evergreen trees. And uh, just working my way around the scene, looking to create some interest within some of the shadow areas under the tree canopy as well. Interesting thing about this painting, it is, you know, a little bit of a complicated scene. And here I'm putting in some of the highlights, um, some of the open spaces of grass and scrubby brush that are picking up some direct sunlight. It's making them glow a little bit. So I have a mixture of uh, lemon yellow and very little bit of sap green and in some cases uh, a little bit of ultramarine or cerulean blue mixed in as well. Just a very, very, very little bit, working my way around with that. Uh, But uh, I'm going to complete this painting in well less than an hour, at least this first sitting. And I would imagine... um, you know, while a master such as Bannister was very well skilled and could easily replicate this kind of quick study uh, and probably do it more masterfully than, than, than I can here at this stage of, you know, my painting journey, uh, he probably took much longer to, cre- you know, to, to uh, you know, create his original masterpiece. Um, and that's not a statement on anything other than the fact that, uh, you know, I'm working these studies in, in between, you know, relatively busy schedule, which consists of work and chores around the house, just like everybody else, uh, who paints. Um, but also with, uh, you know, two teenage kids that are involved in sports and school and such, um, travel soccer, travel baseball and that sort of thing. So, but, um, that speaks to one of the advantages of following this kind of process and incorporating these painting studies. If you work on a small scale, you do a little bit of research and planning ahead of time, you can knock them out in between things uh, in, a re- in a relatively short period of time So uh, and still benefit from some of the gains in insight and ability and judgment and discernment that come along with trying to create them. So, uh, you know, working toward the end of this first sitting that I uh, videotaped for you here and I'll probably wrap it up soon just to ensure that I don't overwork anything or create puddles of mud anywhere (laughs) Uh, to a degree that's just unappealing. And uh, I just want to say I appreciate you uh, joining me and viewing this video. If you have the opportunity to, you know, maybe check out some of the other videos on my channel. If you find this helpful or informative and entertaining in any way, please give me a like and share. And again, I want to thank you for your time and um, the time you invested in viewing my video. For the next few minutes here, I'll probably invest most of my time trying to build upon what I believe should be stronger contrast, uh, mainly, you know, the differences between the highlights and the lowlights. And in the meantime, I hope you have enjoyed this little adventure, learning more about Edward Mitchell Bannister, Canadian-born American painter, African-American who successfully established a painting career in the late 1800s. Very remarkable man, a spiritual man, obviously a, a tremendously great painter for his time and for history for all that matter. One of the things that I'm thinking about as well as I finish up here is uh, dividing my work up into a handful of longer term series, much like this Study the Great series. 
I'm thinking about themes like uh, plein air painting, uh, sports and athletics. And then in addition to that, um, you know, categorizing uh, some of the work that I do. Um, yeah, that's that's original works focusing on different themes like trees and skies. So more on that as time passes. But you'll likely see on my YouTube channel and on my website, uh, thomasmichaelneiman.com, you'll probably start to see the development of um, you know, a reference to those series in an attempt to make it easier for, uh, for me to you know, develop the themes in my paintings and the focus in my paintings. And in addition to that, make it easier for viewers to understand what the paintings are really all about. I'm just building up some additional browns by the use of uh, burnt umber mixed with some of the painter's gray and some black in some instances, in some cases, some white as well when I want to mute it quite a bit. Going back to my palette after cleaning my brush and I'm going to reinforce the reflection of the, the blue sky uh, throughout a couple of portions of the water surface here. A little bit of dappling, a little bit of ripples. Really just kind of going with my gut at this point. And again, never really trying to uh, photo realistically recreate the original gray painting by Edward Bannister, but just trying to um, recreate some of the feel and explore some of the ways with which he may have developed his paintings. As you can see here in the side by side, definitely not, um, definitely not an attempt to recreate it uh, perfectly at all. Um, missed the mark in a couple areas and that's fine. So again, thank you for your time. I appreciate you checking out this video. Please like and share.